Lakeland Currents, your public affairs program for North Central Minnesota. Produced by Lakeland PBS with host Ray Gildow. Production funding for Lakeland Currents is made possible by Bemidji Regional Airport, serving the region with daily flights to Minneapolis St. Paul International Airport. More information available at BemidjiAirport.org. Closed captioning for Lakeland Currents is sponsored by Niswa Tax Service. Tax preparation for businesses and individuals. Online at NiswaTax.com. Hello again, everyone, and welcome to the 12th season of Lake, Lakeland Currents. We're very happy that you're with us. And if you've watched Lakeland Currents on a regular basis, you know that we not only shoot the program here in the, in the Brainerd studio, we also shoot it in the Bemidji show, uh, studio. rather. But this is our 12th season and uh, happy to be back and looking forward to a season of interesting programming. And I don't think it's going to be more interesting than the one today where we have an internationally known photographer, outdoor writer, Bill Marshall, who is from the Brainerd area. And uh, it's a great honor to have Bill back. He was on our show a number of years ago. And since he's been here, lots, lots has changed in the wildlife world and a lot has changed in the, the world of publications and printing. And so we're gonna, we're gonna talk a little bit about that. Bill, welcome to the program. Thanks, Ray. And it's great to have you back again. Thank you. Let's tell the viewers a little bit about who you are, where you came from, and how you got started. Because you are, for the most part, self-taught at what you do, aren't mm -hmm. you? Yeah. Yeah, it, it, you know, I grew up in North Brainerd, close to the Mississippi River, and uh, only a block and a half. And as kids, we, you know, would go down there and mess around, slingshots, bows and arrows, and fishing, and got to really appreciate nature that way. And for some reason, it was just always a fascination for me. So I, uh, you know, I would I would try to learn about everything, try to understand bird books and everything when I was just a kid. And that just kind of progressed uh, through my life. But it wasn't until 1981 that I bought my first real camera. And, you know, at the time, uh, of course, it was film back then. And, you know, I remember signing the loan. Um, <laughs> my hand was shaking because <laughs> it was like worth four times what my vehicle was worth. You know? Wow. So, yeah, it was. So you had a good camera to start with. Right, right. And then, you know, having been an outdoor person all my life, I had an idea of what a good photo was like, even though I was green at it. You know, I thought, I, you know, I know what a good image is because I've looked at them all my life. I've never had never taken them. Well, the very day I got the camera um, in the mail was in the winter time. I went out and, and have got some halfway decent deer pictures that very first day. And uh, um, things just progressed from there. Um, you know, I, I, I worked, I had a normal job, regular job, eight hours a day, and gradually I started reducing that down to half time, and then pretty soon I realized that I was making more money working at home and, and enjoying it, of course, and so I made the switch to full-time freelance, and, you know, whatever, 25, 30 years ago, and uh, I've been there ever since. And you were saying before we went on air that back in that period of time, there were really only about 12 people that were doing what you were doing for a living nationally. I mean, it wasn't that everybody had the skill or the ability to do what you guys were doing. Right. And, you know, when I say 12, it's like if you if you looked at Ducks Unlimited and some of the more popular um, hunting and fishing magazines, especially hunting, um, even nature publications like uh, National Wildlife or Autobahn, yeah, there was a real core of people and um, Ducks Unlimited, for instance, would contact myself and, and you know half a dozen other people, and if they couldn't get what they needed from us, then they would go look further from somebody else. But usually, since we are interspersed around the whole country, um, they could find what they wanted with just that core of people, and it was really nice because you know just about guaranteed to have images in every magazine and, and covers included even their advertising work so yeah so what were some of the magazines you've published with over the years well just about every what i call hook and bullet that would be um sports you know, field yeah, yeah, outdoor yeah. life sports the field is one that i haven't i don't think because they have a little different uh look they're kind of a um uh, i don't know um, safari type magazine, you know, big exotic hunt type mm -hmm. magazines um, and fishing. Um, Field and Stream Outdoor Life, you know, Deer and Deer Hunting, National Wildlife, Autobahn. Those are 
the ones I'm most proud of, you know, the, the nature publications. Really high quality stuff in those magazines. Right, yeah. right, yeah. Very and high quality. Yeah, and you know, the first uh, time I really tried Autobahn, I ended up selling them a cover photo and 12 images inside that magazine. Wow. And one of the images was a, a nominee for an Izzy Award, which at that time was Life Magazine's um, most prestigious wow. photography award. Yeah, it was a nominee. It didn't, I didn't win, but I was a nominee anyway, and that was pretty exciting for me. So when you first started doing your photography, did you focus in on one particular kind of animal, or were you looking for everything? Well, you know, since I've hunted all my life, I concentrated on those species, um, and ducks, uh, you know, deer. Those were my two biggest things to start with, and because we have those locally, and uh, um, you know, then I knew them too, and I also knew the publication, so I knew the type of images that they would be buying, mm -hmm. and. Um, you know, I had to gear everything toward that, you know, there wasn't a lot of um, just go out and shoot anything, you know, it was always had, almost always had a purpose, you know, and that helped me a lot. So you would get an assignment and then go try well, to... Well, not so much an assignment, my own assignment. Oh, okay. I'm looking at my markets and say, well, I, I can't go outside that because it's, I won't make any money if I, if I go beyond the markets that I'm used to. Where, for instance, I don't do much landscape photography, even though I'm out there and see all this cool landscapes, you know, mm -hmm. or flowers or plants, you know, I just don't do much of that because mm -hmm. I don't, I never established a market in that area. So I kind of concentrated on when, well, pretty much wildlife. And you've done billboards, you've said? Yeah, bill, just about anything you can think of, all the way from credit cards to t-shirts. Really? Credit cards? Credit cards, yeah. I still have some at home. I don't know if they're any good or not. <laughs> <laughs> oh, phone cards is what the, I have at home, yeah. You know, the slide through phone mm -hmm. cards are like 20 years old or whatever. I don't know if they're any good, but um, yeah, I, I can't even, you know, if you can imagine a picture being on something, I've probably sold at one time or another. I know you have um, a large buck on our license plate. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk a little bit about how that happened? Yeah, that was really fun for me. Um, I love uh, uh, wandering through the woods in the fall with rattling antlers and a grunt call and uh, during the rut. And uh, um, this particular spot I came to and I thought this is the wind angle and the sun angle, everything was good for rattling. And, and I started to rattle the antlers and I, there was kind of a rise and I see this set of antlers coming up Ooh. you know that's all I could see at first you know and I'm like oh man this is neat and it came over the rise and you know it, it, a lot of times they hear the camera clicking you know they can hear that on a calm day a long way away so it was kind of focused on me and then what they always do when they're a little leery is, is glance downwind you know their eyes and their ears tell them one thing but their nose will tell them what they need to know and Sure enough, I took a couple shots and then it started to glance down. How far away was this animal? Um, 25 yards. Oh, wow, yeah. you were really Real close. close. It was yeah. a beautiful animal. Oh, he's, yeah. If people don't know what we're talking about, it's still on the license plates right, right. for people who elect to uh, critical donate, habitat. Criti critical habitat yeah. if it's the big buck. Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah there's the, the art buck, or art deer. That's uh, This is a photograph yeah. of mine, yeah. And so <clears throat> did you get the picture the first time, the first shot? Yeah, yeah, you had, you know, and that's what with, with deer you have, you, you know, there. it's almost do or die, you know, wow. once they start glancing downwind, it's it's over, you know, wow. and sure enough, it did that, and, you know, it pretty much had that predicted, that it would do that, and because they always do, and, uh, um, yeah, and then it worked out, it was, and I, you know, when they announced they were going to do a white-tailed deer plate, you know, I, well, that was one of the images that I submitted, and one that made it. And, wow. Uh, now, will that stay there? It, it, you know, I, as far as I know, and no, I don't get any um, no royalties, any, no, from no royalties coming, huh? anymore. It was a one-time deal, so because um, they have a moose, buy as many have, as you can. They have birds, and yeah. they have a water yeah. scene. Yeah, there's and, quite a few now. Yeah. Moose State Park, you know, the Lady Slipper, Chickadee, anglers, right. the anglers uh, in the boat, and you know, several others, but. It's a neat deal because that's thirty bucks goes to that's a good, you know, that's thirty dollars extra to get the you plate. Bet. Yeah. Yeah. And I've uh, often wondered how close you were when you took that shot. Because yeah. And and it's always way closer than people think. You know, you, I think one of the one, one reason why people think I can zoom in clear across a lake or whatever <laughs> is because um, uh, sports stadiums, you know, you're at a football or you're watching a football game and the camera's on the crowd and then it zooms right into 
you know, the quarterback calling the play, you know, and it's like with the same lens. Well, that's not possible with uh, 35 millimeter stuff, you know. So how about the writing part of what you do? Because you write for a number of organizations. Mm -hmm. How did you get started in that? And were you comfortable right off the get-go? Uh, no, but, you know, one thing that helped in my writing was, again, the knowledge that I had. I knew what I was talking about, not because, uh, well, because I had research. I researched everything, always finding out, or not even just researching it by reading, but researching it by, you know, witnessing these things and um, figuring it out. And that's how I learned to photograph, too, you know, learned how to operate camera gears, um, you know, no schooling or anything, just, just knowing what I needed to do with it. And same with writing. It's like, okay, how do I want to illustrate this story, both with photos and with my words? And uh, it, it kind of flows, I guess, kind of wasn't that tough for me. And, you know, I could be a lot more artistic, so to speak, in writing, but I kind of like to present the facts um, and then, you know, hopefully it's uh, written well enough where the reader wants to keep reading. But it's so more no, meat and potatoes writing than it is fancy, okay, frilly sure. writing. Yeah. So when you, because I know you write for the Star Tribune and you've written m many times for the Dis Brainer Dispatch, do they usually solicit an idea or do you bounce ideas no, off them? No. Uh, it's almost exclusively my ideas. You know. Once in a while, like with the Star Tribune, I'll converse with the editor and see, you know, I got this idea or that idea, and usually it's a, usually it. it's a goal. Yeah. And that's same with the outdoor magazines. Um, you know, I come up with an idea and present it to them, and th th you know that it kind of goes from there. Not very often do I get an assignment to do something. What you do takes an incredible amount of patience. I don't know if people appreciate how much time you spend. And I've talked with Stan Tequila, who is also a friend of yours, and, and we've talked with him about how sometimes he'll spend days in a blind and, and nothing happens. You have your own property mm -hmm. where you do some of the photography. Some. Do you go other places too? And then do you set up blinds and are you looking for specific things because you know they're in the area? How, how do you approach that? Yeah, it, it's, again, the knowledge of your subject is huge, you know, and you can eliminate a lot of empty time by knowing the subject, when they move, when they don't, how to call them in, how to attract them, what kind of habitat they're in. And so, you know, as far as three days in a blind and get nothing, that doesn't happen very often because I've already got it scouted out. I've got the you know, know the location, um, kind of have an idea of when uh, uh, birds or mammals might be moving. And so I can limit my time, you know, when the light is good, morning or evening. And, you know, no, sitting in a blind all day, um, hoping something happens is uh, not something I do very often. Mm. Um, and, you know, as far as, you know, photographing on my land, that's kind of nice um, because I can, I'm, my office window looks right, right out on everything and I got ponds and thousands of trees planted, fruit bearing and nut bearing trees and everything to attract wildlife. So sometimes I'll see something going on out my office window and then the next day I can take advantage of that. And yeah, wildlife isn't on a clock, but a lot of times if something's happened at like say eight o'clock, this morning, there's a good chance that something similar might be going at eight o'clock tomorrow morning. So I can set up a blind today and then be in it at eight o'clock tomorrow morning. And, you know, by 10 o'clock, if nothing's happened, I might just leave. And, uh, it, it's got to be at times a lonely job. Oh, really? Yeah. Because you're alone <laughs> yeah, all, all the time when you do this. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And even when I'm home, you know, because you know, a home office, you know, you're alone in sure. an office and then alone in the field all the time. Yeah. yeah, it is. That's a big thing. And it's, I'm not just the only one. A lot of my colleagues talk about that too. Mm -hmm. um, is, uh, yeah, it's a lonely job. I can imagine yeah. it is. Now you've won many national awards. Talk a little bit about the Nikon awards because I know you've won a number of those. Yeah. Um, there's an organization called Nikonians, and it's a worldwide organization of um, Nikon camera owners. And uh, they have a monthly online contest, which I don't have the numbers in front of me. I believe there's 40,000 hits per day on that website. Wow. Yeah, and uh, wow. I'm not sure positive about that number, but an incredible amount of people go. And, you know, Nikon is um, one of the top two camera companies in the world so you know it, it, it 
about probably you know half of us wildlife photographers are shooting Nikon and the other half Canon and a mm -hmm. few others in between but um, so yeah it gets a lot of um, hits and um, what happens is they have a theme every month and I submit a, images you can submit five per month and uh, w follows that theme like they might action or something wildlife and action might be a theme and you sent, submit images like that and then the general public um, votes on it for the a month and then out of that five finalists are taken and then um, uh, then they're voted on out of those five finalists and so you know and, and how many times have you won that award? well you know it's been quite a few times actually I've been and this is worldwide fortune worldwide yeah um, I don't know maybe ten times wow eight or ten times wow yeah. that's pretty right impressive. now I'm a finalist um, on the, for the September or no it would be the August contest we vote on it during September um, I'm a little bit behind, so I don't think I'll get first place, but it uh, looks like a shoe-in for second place. Wow, yeah. that's pretty impressive. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about your, your pictures, because uh, you've got some really good images here and some really important information for anybody who wants to take pictures. I think you could give us some really important tips today. Yeah, I tried to, tried to pick out seven or eight photos that, that showed various aspects of wildlife photography, action, you know, um, beauty, um, low light or whatever. Um, I've got a picture of a wood duck in flight is one of them. And, and um, there's so much to that, that that people don't understand. And a wood duck has a lot of iridescent colors. A male wood duck has iridescent colors. And those colors are only visible in a, a couple degrees angle of light mm. you know they're you know iridescence is tiny prisms on each feather and when the light hits it just right like a um, what they call the little things in your um, that you hang in a window that have, you know flash little colors that's what it's like the light has to come in and hit those iridescent feathers just light right otherwise they look dark or black and so this wood duck flying uh, sideways to the camera the light in the afternoon is just right and the way that is able to work is that or I make that work is that they fly into the wind when they take off and they land into the wind when they come in so if the wind is the right angle they'll be coming across in front of the camera at the right angle where the this iridescence will light up are beautiful birds they are Absolutely and, yeah. beautiful. and that's one thing that I like about um, you know getting that the image like this is that it shows the beauty one or two different ang degrees difference and the, the colors are almost gone wow yeah and um and that's true of iridescent um, birds some of the other ones are like cardinals or whatever and they're not iridescent so um the angle can be different with them and you still get a bright red but um, you know, ducks in particular have iridescent feathers. And, wow, that's yeah. a great, a great yeah. image. And then, you know, it, 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 you got to be swinging with them. You know, it's pan panning the camera at the same speed as a bird so that it remains in focus. Wow, I like a little bit of wing blur because that shows motion. You know, it doesn't look like it's a mounted bird up in sure. the air because there's some wing blur. And you know you have to know the shutter speeds for to uh, accomplish that, and then the depth of field, uh, the settings on your camera. It is. I will say this: it's a lot easier now with digital than it was in film. You know, I was shooting 50 speed film, and now I shoot at 400 or wow. 800 ISO, and so I gain like four or five stops of light just by shooting digital now. So wow. that helps a ton when photographing action. And then I like to photograph whitetail deer in the, during the rut and I got a picture of a real nice 10 point buck just facing the camera so close up and I, I rattled that one until I could see it and then it's you know since rattling you're moving your hands and I was kind of just standing behind a tree with a tripod and you're, so I can't do that when they're coming in because they'll see me so then I switched to a grunt call oh. which, and uh, it just kept coming and coming and coming and coming and I'm like hold stop 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 <laughs> it got so close that all I could get was a head and neck how and, close was that oh um, 10 12 yards wow uh, uh, and wow you know I had a zoom lens so I was able to zoom back a little bit as it was coming but um, you know, it just, it just wouldn't stop. I wanted to Did get it. Did he hear you then when you took the picture? Yeah, and you can see in the so photo. So you got one that picture and that's it. Staring right at, you know, you might get a couple off before it bolts, you know. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, it, and then the same thing, it wants to go 
work its way downwind, you know. And so when it ran, it not only ran away, but it, you know, it angled downwind and then got my scent. And then it's for sure that that's a, um, you know, not a good deal. It's yeah. trying to get, vacate the area. Was that on your property? No. 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 Yeah, no. that's a beautiful animal. Yeah. Um, and the next shot that I have is another buck but it's a taken in a whole different situation. In velvet. This one is one in velvet, and they're de obviously that time of the year, this is l the last day in August, I believe, and it's a giant uh, eight, well, it's a nine yeah, point, it but it has uh, Beautiful. huge, Beautiful. huge antlers. One of the nicest bucks I've ever seen in my life. Wow. And, uh, and this, I had to build a blind in a, in a oak savanna, that had, a burr oak savanna, and the acorns were dropping. So. Um, it would not respond to antler rattling at that time of the year or grunting or anything. You just have to hope that they come into a feeding area. And that's what makes this uh, image pretty unique for me is that, you know, it, it, it's like a, it is a crapshoot to be out there at that time. And, you know, it was 80 degrees that day. Oh, wow. And, yeah. And, um, and I watched, I was sitting in the blind looking and I thought, Boy, if that if a deer comes, it'd be nice if it stood between those two trees, and that's exactly <laughs> exactly what happened. That's a great yeah. shot too. And I shot to, it's way low, more lower light than it appears. I actually shot it at one fourth of a second, not at one four hundredth, one fourth wow. of a second. And I had to lock the mirror up on the camera because in a single reflex camera, the mirror flops up and down every time you take a picture. Well, that vibrates the camera and it causes blur at slow shutter speed. So I locked the mirror up, then you can't see. You gotta focus, lock the mirror wow. up, take a shot, and then it would all, it would step, it came a half a step closer every time I took a picture. Did it? Because I couldn't figure out the sound and was. I was in the blind. So uh, it was a home built blind out of brush and sticks and whatever. And uh, yeah, so every time I take a step, I have to drop the mirror back down, refocus, <laughs> pull the mirror back up, and shoot with a cable release too, because if you touch the button at that speed, everything wobbles and wow. it's blurry. Yeah. And you can see every you know, yeah, whisker it's on its face and really eyelashes can. and everything, and the velvet you know, fuzz on the antlers is just, yeah, really That's neat. That's very cool. Yeah, I love that photo, and, and it was one that I specifically set out to do too. I'd seen that buck at sunset the day before, and I thought I gotta do this while the doing's good. Once those burrow acorns are gone, he's it's, gone. It's, he's gone. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And people always like cute photos. And I, this summer, I had uh, three baby raccoons coming in my yard to the bird feeders every day. And I don't know. I never did see mom. I don't know where she was, but uh, they were real cute little things. And and they. Uh, and we're, you know, eating under the bird feeder and then they'd climb up in a big bur oak in my yard and they'd go to sleep, sometimes laying on top of each other, right next to each Cute. other. So I was able to get that picture. You were and pretty close to those too, aren't you? Yeah, that's, you know, that they were just right there. I could get as close or as far as I wanted to. Yeah. They weren't really afraid of me. They would run up the tree when I walked out of the house, but otherwise, you know, once they're in the tree, they feel safe. So, yeah. yeah, that's um, cool. And then, you know, I, uh, weather is always a, a um, factor in wildlife photography. And sometimes, you know, you like the good sun, bright sun, like iridescent feathers show up good. But I always like to photograph, too, in bad weather. And I have a picture of a male cardinal in, in a crabapple tree with the um, snow coming down and the snow on the branches. And a kind of a gray day with a bright red bird is kind of a neat situation. It wasn't that long ago we didn't see many cardinals around our country. Right, right. But they're really becoming quite yeah, common, aren't yeah. they? And, and that's pretty beautiful neat. Bird. Yeah, beautiful yeah, bird. Absolutely beautiful bird. Their song is great. and you know, They're real wary, though. They're hard to photograph. They are. Yeah, they're yeah. Jump, jumpy. Yeah. 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 Um, black bear is something that you know, I really don't go after because the chances are, are you won't, you know, if you've spent time in the woods trying to s photograph a black bear, good luck. But I once in a while do get lucky. I'm out for deer or whatever and have one walk up or something like that. Or one comes into the yard to eat bird seed and, and then, you know, I'll follow it back out in the woods and stay a distance so it doesn't know I'm there. And once in a while I'll get photographs that way. And then, um, coyotes, there's three coyotes. That's that I kind call of unusual, isn't it, to see three together? 
Yeah, yeah, three <clears throat> together. I did call one time five together. And wow. Yeah, that was really unusual. Um, but three of them came in, and it's really funny because they're looking right at me. I was born on a predator call, which is, simulates a dying rabbit, and they're looking at me like I'm lunch, you know. And uh, <laughs> it was just like I love the stare on their eyes. They're all looking. And, of course, right after that, they bolted. You now, know. how close were those two? They together? were a little further because they're spread apart. They were like... Um, 35, 40 yards, well, still something pretty like close, that. Yeah, it was close, yeah. yeah, yeah. Wow. It's fun to have them that close. They're, they're a neat animal. Yeah, they are. Yeah. yeah. Um, then I got a picture of a mink. Here's another kind of cute shot. And that I is got cute. lucky, that's one of the reasons I included this, is that I was photographing ducks from a blind along the edge of a pond. And just by pure luck, I see this mink coming. And the grass was too tall when the mink was on the ground, you know, running along the ground. Well, it got close to my blind and was curious and then stood up on its back feet. Just, again, you know, I got to say it's kind of lucky, but the fact that I was there, you know, definitely helps. Uh, so That's know. cute. Very yeah. good shot. Yeah. We're down to our last two minutes, Bill. Okay. Uh, indigo bunting. Oh, there again, that's beautiful. beauty, a beauty shot, you know. You that just, is a beautiful you bird. Know, you don't have to be... You know, it doesn't have to be in any particular uh, surrounding to have that pretty, but in this case, it was on a newly blossoming crab apple tree. And so. are they, do they let you get pretty close to them? No, they're, they're jumpy pretty, too. You got to be careful. Blind, only a blind can you photograph okay. them out of. Really? Yeah. Yeah. That's a beautiful bird. Well, tell us how people can get a hold of you. You have your own website. Yes. And yep. you are on www.billmarshall.com. I maintain a Facebook page, just about, post an image just about every day. And you can get the URL to that on my website and uh, e my email address. And I also am on Twitter. Um, but, uh, yeah, and, you know, again, posting an image every day on Facebook is a good way for people to get an idea. And, you know, they also can go to my website, of course. And, and I like see. how you have little quizzes to see oh, if people yeah, can. Oh, yeah, that's fun for me, too. Yeah, yeah. that is cool. Yeah. Um, what's your new project? Anything new big coming up? No, it's except I'm, you know, thinking about the whitetail rut, you know. And it's coming so, soon. Yeah, late October and into early November. Well, thanks for appearing on the show. We really appreciate it. It's Thank you, Ray. Beautiful, beautiful work that you do. And if you get a chance, folks, go to his website and you'll see some unbelievable images. Uh, you've been watching Lakeland Currents, where we're talking about what you're talking about. We'll see you next time.